Welcome to The Dental Brief, the world's direct, right-to-the-point podcast produced to get you the information you need to learn and grow your practice. To learn more about our guests and find links to information discussed on our show, visit our website, dentalbrief.com. On to today's episode. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Dental Brief. Today's guest with me, Dr. Richard Maddow. Dr. Maddow, say hello. Hey there. How's everybody doing out in Dental Brief land? I hope everyone is doing wonderful and, and, and going to be doing even better um, after our conversation here today. So go ahead and tell us, for those of you that don't know Dr. Maddow's with the Maddow Group, um, go ahead and uh, give us your background. How'd you get into dentistry? Well, I'm actually a dentist, so that's how I got into dentistry. I, I got accepted to dental school <laughs> way back when. <laughs> what made you like decide I, to become a dentist? Oh, tough question. You know, it's really weird. I am one of three brothers, and we're all dentists, and I'm the youngest of the three. Um, and I guess it was a combination of factors. One, I saw my two older brothers who were all very close. We were back then, and we still are. Um, they were in dental school, and they were enjoying it. Secondly, my grandfather, my paternal grandfather was a physician. He was a surgeon. And he always said, whatever you do, don't do this. I love it. But I'm, you know, every night they wake me up. I have to go to the hospital. I work weekends and I never get to see your grandmother as much as I would like. It's just a tough job. But I've got some friends who are dentists and that's really the way to go. You still treat patients. You still do great things, but your the lifestyle is better. And I think that was a big influence as well. And then I, I think maybe the, the straw that broke the camel's back, so to speak, was um, when I told my mom and my buddies and I were moving out to L.A. to become rock stars because we thought our band was pretty hot when I was in high school. She said that um, if I did that, that, they wouldn't help me pay for an education. So I decided to stay home in Baltimore and go to school. And then, you know, one thing led to the next. And then I became a dentist. It's funny at times of change. I've actually told my, you know, my, my oldest is in the second year of college. And I, I told him, hey, go to Los Angeles, go to Hollywood, try to become an actor. I'll, I'll pay for you to live out there for two years. You just, all you have to do is go to uh, auditions, you know, because I thought, hey, you know what, two years, why not be a great experience uh, for him? So, yeah, I agree. I, I think that, um, you know, my generation of parents, of, uh, our parenting style was a lot different than my parents' parenting style was. And I'm the same way. My daughter's actually a, a really successful writer. I mean, she's done incredibly well. And I was really nervous about that, but decided I'm just going to encourage it and you know let her try and struggle for five or six years, and that's how long it took. And she became a top selling writer. So it's a it's a cool world. So let's talk about struggles. Obviously, we're we're focused on solutions here and improving, getting better. Um, but usually uh, that doesn't happen until we recognize that there's some type of a problem out there. So you you are involved with the Maddow the Maddow Center for Success. Um, you help dental practices all over the country. I think people know the name by now. Um, so talk about a little bit this this webinar series that you've been doing, and I think it's called uh, 10 Dumb Things That Smart Dentists Do. Correct me <laughs> if I'm wrong there. You're, you're, so you can't even say that without smiling, right? 10 yeah, no, you can't. So let's jump right in. Let's talk about these. Sure. Things. We, it's, it's interesting. Um, during the pandemic, we had to come up with a lot of new material because the, the things that, that Dave and I were doing on our road show, so to speak, where we were speaking at all the major meetings, didn't necessarily translate well to virtual meetings, podcasts, et cetera, et cetera. So I started restructuring a lot of our educational materials. And I'm sitting at my desk one day trying to figure out a, a new format for a seminar and I've got music playing, of course, our local college station. And the song called Dumb Things comes on. And I'm just, and I, I knew the song from way back when. Um, I've done all the dumb things is how the song goes. And I just started thinking, you know, in my career as a dentist, I've done so many dumb things. And now, you know, for 30 years, we've been out there helping other dentists succeed all over North America. And a lot of what we do is correcting dumb things that extremely smart people do. Because, you know, I like to think that dentists are really smart and so are hygienists and so are dental assistants and dental business team members. But sometimes just in the day-to-day -day busyness of things, you know, we've got a two patients in the chairs and we've got an emergency on the phone and we've got insurance companies to worry about. We don't worry about some of the things that we should be thinking about and it causes us to do dumb things. So I came up with a list of 10 dumb things that smart dentists do. I think I've done most of them. Certainly uh, many of our coaching clients have done them and all the dentists that we see have done them. So um, it's a little tongue in cheek, but I think it's true as well. You ready so, to go? Should yeah, let's have some fun. Let's jump into them. 
okay, we'll do 10 dumb things that smart dentists do. One is they focus way too much on new patients and not realize that so many of their existing patients are slipping out the back door, so to speak. You know, we get a call from a dentist that's interested in coaching, pretty much 70 to 80% of them say, I need more new patients. I need more new patients. And look, we all love new patients. We help practices get new patients. New patients are great. But pretty much every single time when we do a deep dive into their data, because unless you really know your data, you don't know what's going on in your office, um, we find that they've got so many patients who are on the verge of becoming inactive or they're active, but they don't have an appointment or they, for whatever reason, slip through the cracks. And I think it's just so natural of us to focus on new patients, new patients, when if we just had a great um, system for reactivation, we could be getting hundreds of great patients into our practice who already know us, who already know where we are. Many of them already have treatment diagnosed and those, those are even better. So just something that we shouldn't overlook. Yeah, I'm with you. You got to get that contact information. If somebody leaves because their insurance changes, you better follow up with them every six months. So when it changes back, they come back to you. And I know I was on your website a little bit and you have a, an in-house plan that you help dentists with, which I think is terrific. Another thing, what are you doing to convert them to the in-house plan? So I'm not going to steal a bunch of your time here. Jump on number two. Yeah. But you know, it, and, and you made a good point that people leave and many times they will come back, but I'm even talking about patients who are just in your practice but they just haven't done anything with you. Sure. And then they, then they just, you know, time passes, time passes, time passes. Okay, along the same lines, dumb thing number two, again, when we start really looking into a practice and, and what they're doing correct and what, where, they're, where they maybe could use some help, um, we find that many practices just kind of throw anyone with a pulse at the front desk. And I know all of our team members are so important, but that front desk person, the person who answers the phone, it's kind of of the ultimate importance, more so than the doctor, maybe, because yeah. if they don't get that patient off the phone and into the appointment book, your phone could be ringing all day long. You could be spending all the money in the world on marketing, and then the phone rings, and then the person that answers the phone doesn't know what to do with it. And I see that on the dental brief, you've had guests before who have spoken about this. So hopefully your listeners are familiar with this situation where the front desk person has to be so beautifully trained to get that patient off the phone and into the appointment book. And in our podcast, in our Dental Practice Fixers podcast, we do secret shopper calls every week, two or three of them. And it's incredibly rare that the person at the front desk knows how to properly ask for the appointment. It just never happens. It's scary. I'm with you. What else you got? All right. You want me to just keep rolling with these? I want you to roll. You're doing great. Excellent. Yeah. I love this. This <laughs> well, great. Yep. Always good to get some positive feedback, right? No, it's awesome. I'm with you 100%. Yeah, I've no disagreements okay. here. Cool. Number three, dumb things that smart dentists do. And I just want to preface this by saying I'm not anti-technology. I love the latest and greatest fancy dental equipment, just like all your dental listeners. Cone beam x-rays are incredible. CEREC is a magnificent technology. But way too many dentists buy these expensive technologies thinking that it will solve the problems they're having in their practice. And they go into further debt to do this. And then, you know, a year later, they're, they're thinking, wow, was that salesman at the Chicago Midwinter meeting who told me if I buy this technology, it'll improve my practice? Did he really have my best interest at heart? No, of course he didn't. He sure. may have been selling a great piece of equipment, but it's pretty rare that spending money on equipment helps a practice's bottom line. You know, I always say... Um, has a patient ever said to you, I'll only get that crown if you can do it in one visit? No, it's great if you can do it in one visit, but you're not going to lose business because of it. So technology is great, but if you can't afford it, if you're going into debt to purchase it, you really need to analyze what your true return on investment will be, not what some salesperson tells you it will be. Yeah, it's oftentimes that when there's problems with people, those people will look at products as being the issue, right? They'll say oh, it's the processes or the, the products, and oftentimes it's with the people. So you're 100% right on that. It's not before. Yeah, almost, like a, almost like a build it and they will come, but, but a dentist thinks buy it and they will come, and it yeah. just doesn't work. Yeah, yep. you're 100%. Cool. What's, what's number four? Number four, I'm not a Southerner. Well, Maryland, I'm from Maryland. We're kind of in between North and South, but I'll use a, a Southern expression. And it's something that dentists don't do. And that is, you got to dance with who brought you. You know, it's dentists get distracted, especially when 
their revenues aren't as high as they think they should be and they're looking for ways to earn more money. They get distracted. Many times they get distracted in non-dental things. You know, they're investing in their cousin's brewery or they get involved in some kind of MLM thing, selling hand lotion that's $85 a, a jar or whatever. Um, when for just about every single dentist, being a dentist is your best path to to earning a good income and, and to sure. doing great things. Um, and we get distracted by that. And another, maybe a, a tangent on that is that sometimes dentists think they get that owning multiple practices is the key and they get distracted and open up a satellite office, which I can't stand that term satellite office. Like, Oh, you know, we can't see in our downtown office. There's this office that rotates around the sun. Why don't you come see us there? Um, okay. When meanwhile, they're just <laughs> doubling their overhead and doubling their <clears throat> headaches. And if they would just concentrate on, doing the good old bread and butter procedures, endo core and crown, scaling and root planing, implant abutment and crown in their one office and work on that, they're gonna be more profitable and have fewer headaches. So you gotta dance with who brought you. And it's, for most people, it's good old bread and butter dentistry in one office. Yeah, no, it's great advice. If you're buying watermelons for a dollar each and selling them for a dollar each, selling more watermelons isn't gonna help you, right? You can't make it up in quantity? Yeah, no, you can't. Yeah, so what's, that, what's step number five? <laughs> and by the way, I do, wonder if, I do wonder if Elon Musk is going to invest in satellite offices sometime here in the dental offices. <laughs> he, he's going to launch a satellite office. Yeah, what's number five? <laughs> number five is have a practice that is not calibrated. And when we say a practice is calibrated, that means if a patient asks a question, it could be, clinical, it could be about insurance, about policy, about anything, they need to get the same answer from every team member in the office. And I'm sure you've experienced this, maybe not in a dental office, maybe in a retail store or somewhere else where you ask the same question or the version of the same question to different people and you get a different answer. You know, there are people out there who'd like to ask as many people as they can until they get the answer they want. Yeah. So that can't happen in your dental practice. When your practice is calibrated, it means that you have kind of made a list of your frequently asked questions, things the patients ask, and you've, as a team, come up with the best answer and you've practiced. And you know that if a patient asks a question to anyone in your office, they're going to get the same answer. Yeah, and I would, I would advise too, we tell people this all the time, that they, they should have a frequently asked questions page on their website. Because those questions that people are asking in the practice are the same questions that they're asking Google and why not be there? To show them so i think that's a win-win idea i'm not sure if you agree with that or not but uh, well let me get I, I gotta tell you i want to jump on that for a second so yeah. um i feel like i've seen a thousand plus dental websites that may be actually underestimating and i cannot tell you how many pages on dental websites are a complete waste of time and space going into clinical explanations of things and all this garbage when a frequently asked question page would would be the page that 90% of the time people are going to want to go to. I totally agree. You can yep. cover so much ground in that instead of distracting them with stuff that makes no sense. And, you know, the, the purpose of the website, just like the purpose of the phone call is to make the patient move forward to the next step, sure. which would be making the appointment and a, a good frequently asked question page will absolutely do that. So fantastic tip. Yeah. I think we're on a uh, six. What's six? Six is, when a dentist tries to, and I know this is audio, but I'm making air quotes here. When a dentist tries to sell treatment to a patient, I cannot stand those courses where they say, come to our weekend boot camp and we're going to teach you the secrets of treatment planning success. And then they say, and, and you've got a, it's like a, like a flow chart. If the patient says this, you say that here's you, if they say this, you come back with this. Like you're like, it's like you're on two different sides of the fence. Like, and if they say this, you say that, and then you look them in the eye and say, isn't this the kind of dentistry that you want? What's preventing you from from making your next appointment? And it's very used car salesman. And the bottom line is you cannot sell dentistry. Your patients will say yes to your dentistry when you establish a relationship of trust and of confidence. You know this, you, you know this from what you do. Yep. It's all about relationships. Yep. You can't force somebody in. And if you do use these used car salesman techniques, nothing against used car salesmen. I'm sure there are plenty of great, honest used car salesmen out there, but they're selling a commodity. So it's a totally different kind of thing. Um, the patient has to love your practice, trust you, know that they're going to a great dentist. And then as long as you make things affordable, they're going to say yes. And they, 
they can't feel like you're pressuring them. It's just a bad vibe. Let's talk about used car salesmen for just a moment, real quick second, because something that we've seen shifted last year, Carvana, I, I don't, I'm not here to plug them. I'm not endorsing them at all, but Carvana <laughs> sold more used cars in this country than all, than any other dealer group. But I mean, Auto Nation has hundreds of stores. So, um, and it's this online, there is no salesperson. There's other dealerships that have taken that process away where it's one price, there is no sales. It's, we were here to show you cars and you decide whether you want to buy or not. So I think when you think about in dentistry and, and people that are trying to oversell like that used car salesman, look what's happened to those professions, right? Those, those jobs are actually going away and being replaced by auto dispensing machines in Las Vegas. So, Wow, what, fantastic point. Yeah, I had what, no idea the Carvana was selling that many cars. I actually, have you ever seen one of those, the, the car vending machines? I drove past one. I can't remember what it was. Yeah, only on TV. And I'll tell you, I have friends that have bought vehicles there and, and other brands like that, um, and they really enjoy the process. And, you know, ironically, they end up paying a little bit more for a car than they would if they bought it locally, but they enjoy this process. Personally, I'd want to see the car. But anyways, <laughs> <I'd like> to... <laughs> anyways um, let's jump on to step number, uh, or, uh, number, number, I think seven. we're on step. Yeah. Yep. Number seven is overcomplicating patient payments and finances. It's just a dumb thing that smart dentists do. Um, you need to have, obviously, you need to be able to come up with a plan to make your treatment affordable for your patients. Dentistry can be very expensive. And, you know, many people don't have five, six thousand, eight thousand dollars $8,000 budgeted where they could just whip out the cash or the credit card. So you've got to make your you got to make your finances uncomplicated. And we're at the Matto Center, we're big believers in care credit. We love care credit. But, you know, whatever third party financing company you're using, you don't need to go through the whole dog and pony show, 20 minute explanation, scaring the patient about, you know, there's an application. And we're going to ask you a million questions. And and if you get approved, well, if you don't get approved, blah, 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 blah. Here, here's how I like to present third party financing. It takes five seconds. You say, Patrick, your treatment today is $2,400. You can pay cash, check, or credit card, or we've got another fantastic option for you. 12 months interest-free. That would be just $100 a month. Did I say 2400 or whatever? That would be just $200 a month. How's yeah. that sound to you? Boom. That's all you need to say. You've right. got a great plan, 12 months interest-free. It'll be $200 a month. Is that something you're interested in? And then boom, they say yes. Then you do all the paperwork, and it's just a beautiful world. Um Let's not make it complicated by offering too many options or confusing people. Yeah, I'm with you. Let's get on to eight. Eight is not using what I call specialized professionals. And, you know, every dentist needs an attorney, an accountant. Many of us need web designers. Many of us need marketing companies. You know, many of us need, um, I'm trying to think, um, lease negotiators, whatever. Yeah. And way too many times we wind up saying, um, oh, yeah, my nephew is great with computers. He's going to design my website. Oh, yeah, my sister-in-law does marketing for a coffee shop. She's incredible. So, of course, she can do it for my dental practice. I know you're with me on this one, aren't you? Of um, course. Yeah, I've been down this road. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Right, right. No matter what field I just talked about, whether it's your attorney, your accountant, your marketing company, um, your lease negotiator or whatever – there are people who specialize, your, your financial advisor, there are people who specialize in working with dentists and they know the ins and outs of dentistry. They know the terminology. They know, you know the facts and figures of a dental practice and they're always going to do a better job. And you, know, you don't need an attorney that often. You only need one great marketing company. These are things that you really have to worry about. Find the right person who specializes in dentistry and go with it, especially if they come highly recommended. Um, just don't make the mistake of using somebody who's too much of a generalist for these really all important tasks. Yeah, obviously we agree there. I, um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's important. I mean, it's it clearly no one would recommend that I grab a YouTube video and watch how to you know, fill a, a, a profi and, uh, you know, take care of the <laughs> cavity and, and do it myself. Cause I watched a video and expect me to be any good at it. Right. Um, so uh, yeah, hundred percent there. I think we're on, are we on nine or 10, nine? Nine we're on nine. Nine. I think we're on nine. Nine. Number nine is, yeah. and I've seen so many dentists do this, and I'm so glad I didn't fall victim to this. I remember way back when, um, when I was a hospital resident, it was 1984, 
And one of the one young attending, really young, cool guy, he was kind of like one of us. He was closer in age to the residents as he was to most of the attendings. Took us out for some beers one night, and he just said, um, "You know, we talked. We we in the clinic, we're learning how to do crowns and root canals and this and that. But I'm going to teach you the most important lesson that you're going to learn at your residency. That is, don't make the same mistake I did, which was." As soon as I got my dental license, opened up a practice and started earning some money, I went out and bought a Mercedes and I bought a boat and I did this and I did that. He said, don't live, don't live what you feel is the dental lifestyle, especially early on in your career. You know, yeah. don't, you should always have your retirement plan set up. You're never too young for yet for that. Um, your college savings plan for your kids. If you have kids and they're that age, have all this stuff structured. Um, and then once you've, filled in all that money, then you can spend on anything you want because everything you're spending is money that's kind of left over. So always spend less than you earn, have your correct savings plan set up. And then if you want to buy the Mercedes or the boat, if that, I, I'm not that into that kind of stuff, but for a lot of people, it's really fun. And it's, uh, you know, they get a real kick out of those kinds of things. So do it, do it, but just make sure that you're not living the dental lifestyle and overextending and going in debt and all those things. Yeah, and always remember, too, that in the, all these toys that we buy, they own us. It's never the other way around. Whether you pay cash <laughs> or finance, they own you, right? Trust me, coming from a guy who watched a really nice sports car get flat tires because I never used it sitting in my garage so often, uh, yeah. um, right? So I, I understand, you know, it's just one more thing to take care of and, and, and uh, maintain. So let's jump on to step number. I'll also... A lot of student debt, I hear about the cost of uh, dental school and student debt nonstop, especially on social channels. If you, if you pay off those student loans early, instead of buying that Porsche, make a big, big difference in, in your life. Uh, let's jump on step number 10 or, or item number 10. Item number 10 is having a negative happiness equation. This is a mistake that a lot of dentists make. And the happiness equation was actually coined by my friend, Dr. Patty Lund. He's a dentist in Australia. And he had a negative happiness equation to the point where he actually had a nervous breakdown and had to take about six months off. And then he came back and he restructured his entire office. So as he defines it, the negative happiness equation means that you really don't like going to your office. You really don't like practicing dentistry and being around your team and your patients, but you're willing to put up with that so that you can have money to spend on your weekends where you're going to go out and have fun. So, you know, if you're, if you're hating life Monday through Friday, so you can enjoy it Saturday or Sunday. Well, that's no way to live. And then your Saturdays and Sundays kind of start shrinking because you get the Sunday night blues, worrying about, oh, shoot, I've got to go to work tomorrow. And then on, it takes you the entire Saturday just to wind down. So you really not only have a negative happiness equation, you have a zero happiness equation. Um, I think it's really important for every dentist to, to love what they do. I, I was going to say every single day, it's impossible to love what you do every single day. I'm a realist. But you should love what you do just about every day. And a lot of it has to do with the people you surround yourself with. It has to do with your team. Um, you really should enjoy being with your team. Your team members, along with being A-plus superstars at their jobs, should be people that you wouldn't mind hanging out with when you're outside of work. I'm not saying you should or have you know that close of a relationship with your team, but at least you should really enjoy the company of your team. Um, Having a negative happiness equation is just a bad way to live. Life's way too short. Well, Dr. Maddow, this is awesome. We're so grateful to have you here. I think we've covered one through 10, right? We have. In the short I think we moment. did it with, in, in the brief amount of time. I think we did it. Yeah, and they can dive, our audience can dive deeper into this and go to your website, maddow.com, right? The, the Maddow Center for Dental Practice Success. And you actually have a series that you put together or a webinar that you put together where you dive deeper into this, correct? Yes, I'm pretty sure that's on there. Um, yeah. Just to clarify, Maddo is spelled with one D, M-A-D-O-W. So it's M-A-D-O-W dot com. And if you go there also, we've got a free downloadable book about how to get those patients that are asking difficult questions off the phone and into the appointment book. So if you just go to maddo.com slash profit, that's a free book download. It's a great book, no obligation, or we're not going to grab your credit card or anything like that. We just want you to see what we're all about and get some good information at the same time. Love it. Thank you so much, Dr. Meadow. We appreciate you being here. It was my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us on today's episode. Did you know you can weigh in on today's topic on Facebook? Search The Dental Brief on Facebook or visit our website, dentalbrief.com, and just follow the link. 
We look forward to having you join us again on another episode of The Dental Brief.